Our next performer is a man so potent, he's the reason we legally have to sell alcohol at our shows. He's a stand-up comedian, improviser, writer, and avid Dungeons & Dragons adventurer. He's been languishing in a marketing day job throughout this entire week, surviving only by the knowledge that he would be able to spend tonight with you. Welcome, Kirk Faulkner. Hey, everybody. How you doing? Good? Good? Don't talk to the other performers, but you can talk to me a little bit. You guys are doing all right? <laughs> Who's in the mood to hear a drinking story? <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Nothing like a good drinking story, you know? It's like all the fun, debaucherous adventure, none of the consequences for you. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. This drinking story takes place in 2006 when I was a young playwright living in New York City. Uh, it was very early in my drinking career. I was 26 years old at the time, but I, I didn't start drinking until late in life, until uh, I was 23. I started late. I took to it like a duck to water. Don't worry about that part of it. I, I was doing it. I was, I was really going after it. In fact, I was drinking maybe a little more than uh, I should have been at the time. You know, I, I hadn't grown up drinking. I didn't have a lot of uh, strategies around how to drink. And so uh, I found myself maybe drinking a little too much, and, and I decided I would go uh, to a shrink. I'd go to a psychiatrist and try to learn some strategies about drinking. And uh, to put, put this in context, I learned a lot about uh, the psychiatrist who I went to see later. Uh, this is just help put his advice he gave me uh, <laughs> in, in, in a scope. He, uh, he, would, he would take notes on the pornography that I, I watch. He would ask, what kind of pornography you're watching? And he'd take notes so that he could check out the URLs later himself. And uh, I, I looked him up, actually, before I came and did this story, and he did get disbarred for inappropriate contact with a, with a client. So that we know that about him. Uh, I, uh, I went to him, and we were talking about it. I said, you know, I just don't know how to uh, be moderate with my drinking. He said, you know what, Kirk, you're an anxious guy. I can tell that about you. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prescribe you this pill. It's called a Klonopin. I'd never heard of this pill at the time. And he said, next time you feel uh, anxious, instead of having a, a drink, just have a Klonopin. Is anybody in the audience going like, oh? <laughs> so uh, I say, okay, all right, I'll try that out. So I, I, went, uh, I went home, and then that weekend, um, uh, when I would have normally just cracked open a beer, I, uh, I was feeling a little anxious, you know, after a long week, and I said, you know what, I'll try a Klonopin. So I took a Klonopin. Didn't really help too much. So I tried a second Klonopin. And then I thought, you know what might really help? Two Klonopins and a beer. And that felt great, so I had another beer. And then I had another beer. Then I called my friend Stella over, and I said, Stella, come over, bring some whiskey, because Stella's from Tennessee, and Stella knows good whiskey. Uh, and so she, she said, okay, I'll come over. And Stella was friends with me in the, um, from the, uh, the, the playwriting program I was in. She was about five foot one, about 85 pounds. That becomes important later in the show. <laughs> so Stella comes over with the whiskey, and we start drinking. And uh, we drink and drink and... Uh, I was living in the Lower East Side of uh, Manhattan at the time, and the Lower East Side, if anybody's been there, even now, even with the Disneyfication of New York, was it's just it's a playground for reprobates. I mean, it's just it's like a it's Legoland for drunks, like just everybody wandering around. Um, and we uh, d we we launched out and became those people that night, and we went on a little we went on a little tour of the Lower East Side. The first place we went was a uh, a uh, a hipster bar called Welcome to the Johnsons. I dare you to come up with a more hipster name for a bar. And in Welcome to the Johnsons, right against the main wall was this giant couch. And um, in my mind, even when I was sober, but especially that night, whoever owned the couch owned Welcome to the Johnsons. That was the p seat of power. And so I went in, and I had become pure ego. I had entered in what is, what is known uh, in uh, technical terms as a walking blackout. My, my id had taken over, and uh, the rest of me was just along for the ride. And I walked into Welcome to the Johnsons, and I walked up to the people sitting on the couch, and I said, hello, I am the king of Welcome to the Johnsons. <laughs> this is my couch. And they got up. They got up and they left. <laughs> and we sat on that couch. And we, we, gave, we, we had what Welcome to the Johnsons had to offer for us, which was more whiskey and, and some PBR. And uh, we drank there. And then um, we walked down the street to a place called Rudy's Guitars, Rudy's Music, I think. Uh, it's one of the oldest guitar music stores in, in, in the village. Uh, and I walked in and I walked up to the lady at the front. And I said, uh, ma'am, I have a question for you. What is your most expensive guitar and 
without thinking on her part, she pointed to it. And this is what I did. To this day, is a very talented playwright. Uh, she just had something put on in uh, in Boston recently, and she was inviting us to a a, a night of one act plays uh, put on by the Asian American community, young Asian American playwrights. All of them, six plays, one acts. Good event for me at this stage, right? <laughs> so we go to these plays, and uh, <coughs> to put it lightly, I wasn't super well behaved uh, for the first five plays. I was making a lot of comments. Uh, I was laughing, I was making jokes, and people were annoyed. I could tell people were annoyed. I didn't really care that people were annoyed, but they were annoyed. And um, then the sixth place started, and I just remember the, the it started off with like the most hackneyed like like dialogue I'd ever heard, and like the characters like just got set up so stupidly, and like they they, they were so two dimensional, and I. I just started going off in my head about like, oh, this is bad. This is really bad. This play is no good. Everybody else around me was happy because I had finally shut up and I was just sitting there. <laughs> but I was sitting there fuming. And the way Stella tells it is like this. She says she missed me by that much. She turned as I said, I got to do something about this. And she went to grab me and just, just missed me. As I strolled down the aisle and got up on stage <laughs> and put my hands out and said, Ladies and gentlemen, this play is awful and it needs to stop right now. <laughs> this is a good stage crew. They dragged me off immediately and kicked the shit out of me <laughs> in the back of the theater. No joke, they really beat the shit out of me. Like, I, I, I got to give these guys credit. Rightly so, rightly so. I left my bag behind, so Stella actually had to come try to find me later. She found me about an hour later uh, at the closest McDonald's. I was at the front uh, counter demanding jalapeno poppers from the poor people who work there. And she said, what did you do? Why did you do that? I said, did I do something wrong? She said, well, what are you, what's wrong with you? And I grabbed my bag from her, and I ran into the night. I don't know how I got home. I woke up the next morning. Totally bruised, but good drinking story, right, huh? Yeah! That was fun, that was fun. I had a good time telling you guys that story. I had such a good time. I'm gonna tell you guys a second story. I didn't tell David I was gonna do this. We're, all, we're only supposed to get one story, but I got a second story for you. It's 2006, and I'm a young playwright living in New York. And I get this chance to be in a night of one-act plays. And, you know, I'm Asian. And it's a night for young Asian playwrights, but I don't really care about that. I just care that I get to put my play up. You know, this is what I want to do. And so I work on it. I work hard. I, I work on that script. I get, I get the cast together. I get a director. And then it's the, it's the night of the show, and I've invited everybody. I've invited all my friends. I've invited my family. I'm last. I'm last in the show. It's like I'm headlining the show. It's so great. I'm so excited. And my play starts, and it's going perfectly. Everybody's hitting their lines, hitting their marks. And five minutes into it, this guy gets up. And he walks down the aisle, and he gets on stage in the middle of my play. And he 
puts his hands up and he says, this play's awful, it needs to stop right now. And like, I couldn't believe it. I, I, I was just sitting there like, wh- wh- what is this guy doing? And he gets off and, and I, I don't know where he goes. And I, you know, honestly, I never saw the guy again. And afterwards, everybody came up to me and the worst thing was they all kept coming up to me going like, oh, I loved how you wrote that thing into the middle of your play where the guy got up. <laughs> and I smiled and nodded. I couldn't tell them that that wasn't, that wasn't my play. That was, that was something else. And I, th- I think about that guy sometimes, and I, I bet he tells this story a bunch. I bet he goes to parties. I bet he goes, like, just when he's hanging with his friends. I bet he even gets invited to weird storytelling events. <laughs> and he gets up and tells his story like it's some great fucking story. And I wonder if he ever thinks about me. Thanks, guys. Kurt Faulkner.